Welcome, I'm Julie Thompson, Executive Director of PAC TV, and today we're hosting a special COVID-19 update for the town of Pembroke that has to do with restaurant reopening. We're hosting this with uh, Lisa Cullity, who is the um, health agent for the town of Pembroke. You can watch it on Comcast Channel 15 or online by streaming our streaming channel at pactv.org slash live. Sorry about that. For questions during this forum, and you might have quite a few, please email them into pembrokeinfo at pactv.org. And this will be replayed um, as of this evening if you go to pactv.org slash Pembroke. Right now, let's turn it right over to the health agent, Lisa Cullity, to introduce what we're going to talk about today. Hi, Lisa. Can't hear you. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> oh, there we go. There it is. Now we can uh, hear you. Okay. Okay. So, thank you so much for taking, um, you know, the time and, and Pack TV being so dedicated to all of these issues that everyone wants to know so much more about. Um, and today we wanted to focus on restaurant reopening. One, because everyone, of course, is so excited about it. Um, but two, but there's so many questions surrounding um, the rules and regulations. And, and restaurants are not going to look um, like they did when we were last there in March. So obviously, we've, we've, most of us have seen or heard the governor's uh, orders or illusions about um, the, the restaurant operations. And... The, the regulations, what we've done in Pembroke is we've tried to condense them into a very simple document. That document is four pages long um, in order to assist our restaurants in getting reopened as quickly as possible. So to that end, we have uh, a document that I believe I've sent over to you, and we can jump right into what are going to be the high points and what are restaurants going to look like um, when we see them open. Okay. And the first... Go I'm ahead. Sorry, go ahead. So we'll just, um, I will follow along with you and the people at home sure. can follow on also. And I will be clicking the boxes as you speak to each one so people know where we are. Oh, we lost Fantastic. you. Fantastic. I'm coming right back. I'm just, okay. I was just checking my connection because uh, that was not looking normal. You, there you, we go. That's good. That's fine. Okay. Okay, we got you. Um, so anyway, I, I, I apologize completely. I, I think the internet connection might be struggling a little bit here. Um, so we're going to jump right in. And, and of course, all of our COVID efforts um, have been focused on, you know, not conveying this disease from one another. And of course, there's challenges when you go into an environment like a restaurant of how do we maintain um, social distancing. So one way to combat that is, of course, to allow the restaurants to use outside space. And actually, just before you went on, literally, as you and I were chatting before we went on air, Julie, um, the state representative was was messaging me and that the restaurant reopening um, strategy has passed the the representatives and it's going to the Senate. It's expected to be rapidly approved and rolling out later today. So that's great news. That means all this stuff in the governor's order and all those things we've been working on, it looks like will come to fruition. So starting with social distancing, we already know this. Social distancing shouldn't feel new to anybody. We want to maintain six foot of separation in between individuals. We want to do that when we're dining out. Now that six foot of separation does not apply to people within your party. Mm -hmm. If you're going out to the restaurant with your immediate family, maybe one or two friends, that's wonderful. But the six foot of social distancing is between you and other parties, not between members of their own party. So everyone can sit at a table um, and the table should be set up six feet apart to ensure um, six feet of separation. The, the, the Tables and workspaces should be set up that distance apart. Everything will be outside to begin with. Um, designating assigned working areas to workers whenever possible. So what that's going to be is, you know, we've all seen restaurants with, with waitresses with a certain area that's theirs, and sometimes those areas will overlap in certain restaurants. That is being strongly discouraged with the, this section of the governor's orders, that they don't want waitresses crossing paths unnecessarily. Um, staggering work schedules. Obviously, we're going to need to make sure that the restaurants, as they move through reopening, um, are not unnecessarily overlapping staff. You don't want to have, you know, one set of staff come on at three and then four and then five and then overlapping on the tail end. We're going to want to keep um, minimal staff on to do the job appropriately and safely, but um, to not be overlapping staff any more than absolutely necessary. 
Um, and once we've done that, we're going to minimize the use of confined space. So all dining initially in phase two will be outside. There will be no interior dining at all as a part of phase two. Um, so expect to see a lot of open air seating, expect to see a lot of lawn seating, expect to see seating set up um, within parking lots. Now, one thing that changed from the governor's original directive to the one that he released, I don't even know what day it is anymore, Thursday. So he released on Monday. Um, he announced it yesterday, but the, the, the template was actually up on Monday, is that the governor is going to allow coverings for those seating areas, whether that's a table umbrella or something that we would more think of a commercial style tent that would be over these seating areas for either sun protection or weather protection that is going to be allowed. However, that structure should not have sides. And if it is going to have a side or a butt to a building for whatever reason, that no more than 50% of the wall space can be covered. Um, so that's that's an interesting thing about the outside is that they are gonna allow tents, umbrellas and other things to protect from the weather, which I think is excellent. Um, when you go to an establishment, let's say you wanna go out to eat or if you happen to work in a food establishment, facial covers are, are going to be required while moving out the out around the establishment while you come in for those working, certainly that's gonna be a requirement. Um, you are allowed to remove your facial covering when you sit down at your designated table seating area. Um, obviously, if you get up to go to the bathroom or get up to go back to your car for something, you should put on your mask again. Um, and then the last thing that's going to be really key for restaurants, and never mind that it's just a good idea, um, but from a, from a logistics, a management, and a safety standpoint, that outside seating must have management personnel dedicated to the area. So this should not be a wait staff that's going in and out. This should not be some, some sort of other staff that's, that's working inside the building in an office area. This is a dedicated management type employee, hostess type employee, someone um, that is capable of overseeing that outdoor space where they can have eyes on that outdoor space the entire time. And they should have access to telephone. Obviously a simple cell phone would be good enough, but they should have access that God forbid if anything were to happen, and they could call for emergency services, call for help, um, and, and put a halt if there was any um, inappropriate behavior. They could certainly reach out to emergency services to, to put a halt to inappropriate behavior. And that's uh, that's also required for the very important, that as we just found out from our awesome state representative um, that's been handled at the, the um, representative level and is on to the Senate, um, is for the alcohol, alcohol um control board so that we can enjoy cocktails with our dinners again, which would be a lovely thing. So, but Julie, we wanted to pause on each section. Do you do you have any questions, or does anyone else have any questions on that first section we just covered? Um, yes. Can um, let me. Uh, I have one so far. Take your time. Yep. What about um, people that are waiting for seating in in these outside mm -hmm. uh, venues? Uh, where do you go? How do you wait for seating? Sure. That's actually covered in another section, but let's take it up right now. So it's going to be advisable for a lot of reasons. Um, let's say Lisa Cullity decides to go out dining, you know, once these restaurants are open. It is strongly recommended to have a reservation. And we know not every establishment has a reservation. We know not every establishment can, can set up reservations, but it would be optimal. Um, to call ahead, make sure seating's available. What people should not do is walk up to an establishment, ask for seating, find that their seating is going to be a half an hour or more, um, anything other than a few minutes. Um, they should go ahead and make that appointment for their seating, and then they should consider returning to their car, um, returning at a different time, taking a walk, whatever, but, but no establishment, nor should the people doing this. I mean, the we all have to accept a little responsibility for our own safety, not to be lining up, congregating, sitting in a waiting area. You know, any kind of a crowd is not an optimal um, condition to be in right now. So we're not going to want to do that. The restaurants shouldn't be allowing you to do that. So try to make your appointment. And if it's at a time different than you thought or you're walking up and you got assigned a different time, take a walk, go back to your car, come back at your, your appropriate seating time so that we don't have people congregating because that would be a problem. Okay, perfect. So why don't we go on to the next section that you have, which is hygiene sure. protocols? Yep. So obviously we, we are already familiar with this particular virus. We want to stay on top of our hygiene. And that's so, so important. So with that, we want to we want to start off with the obvious. And please, this is not new information to any of the restaurants. All workers must wash their hands frequently. 
this isn't rocket science. The, the, the restaurants have already been doing all of this. Is every restaurant owner I know going to push this even more? Of course they are. Um, but that that's a pretty obvious one, and, and we should already know that. And we all at home should be doing that more as well. Um, ensure access to hand-washing facilities. So the number one question I'm getting asked is, are bathrooms going to be open? Yes, they are going to be open. You are expected to use the bathroom and go in and wash your hands frequently. Um, and, and that's going to be so important because hand-washing facilities... Um, um, both for the cooking staff inside the kitchen, which all kitchens have, as well as hand washing facilities for the staff and the patrons. So bathrooms will be open, bathrooms will be able able to be used to ensure that we have that good hand washing. The next thing is the alcohol-based hand sanitizers. We're strongly recommending that every restaurant have hand sanitizer on hand. And we know hand sanitizer can be somewhat difficult to get, but remember restaurants have access to industrial type dispensers, industrial uh, type equipment that not everyone has access to. So some of those supplies are gonna be even easier for them to get rather than the pump bottle we try to you know, procure at CVS. You may see some creative hand washing stations where someone has, you know, maybe mounted to a, to an outside tree stand of some sort, what would normally be a sanitizer you would see inside of an establishment on a wall. Um, so we're all, all gonna have to be a little patient and creative, you know, as we see some of those things repurposed to make sure everyone's safe. Um, but I would expect to see things like that and that would not be a cause for concern. Um, supply workers with adequate cleaning products. Again, we have, trouble in the private industry getting stuff, but from what I can gather from the professional cleaning industries, which go in often to restaurants when they're closed at night, as well as the clearing houses that supply them, um, their supply is a little more robust than ours. Um, so that's wonderful news for us. Again, cleaning supplies are nothing new to restaurant. Contact sanitizers are nothing new to restaurants. Um, food safe contact sanitizers are, are nothing new to restaurants. They All of them have them on hand all the time. This is going to be new to restaurants, though, posting visible signage to remind the workers and customers of hygiene. Um, this is where I think the state's done an awesome job on the state website. There's a dozen different little signs you can print. You don't have to go to a printer and get something fancy made up. You can sit there and just print at home or print at your work um, the signs you need, um, which is really helpful. Or you can make a more creative or more beautiful sign. Certainly, if you have a higher end establishment of any kind, you can go ahead and do that. But the, the signage is all there. It's all free. Just print it and hang it up um, and you're all set. Self-service. Um, everyone loves a good buffet. I love a good buffet. We're not having buffets. There will be no self-serving of any kind whether it be drink, dessert bars, uh, buffets of any kind, there will be no self-service, no self-service salad bars or anything like that. For the obvious reasons of too many people touching all the same serving devices and, and clustered together at lines, it's, it's dangerous and those are strictly prohibited. And the next thing is condiments and, and the things that we're used to seeing preset on a table. We are not gonna see that anymore. Um, we are going to see things perhaps brought out upon request. We might be seeing even at upscale establishments more single use items. And that's for the obvious reason of you don't want people touching the same multiple items over and over again. Um, every contact is an opportunity for the virus to spread and we wanna minimize that. And certainly there will be upscale restaurants that will want to use those same condiments that they've always used. Um, just understand that their busing staff is gonna have some extra work on their hands because that's gonna need to be sanitized between each and every use. So when you sit down, um, don't be afraid to ask a server, hey, you know, could I, could I have the salt or could I have the ketchup and understand that it is not, you know, not out at the moment you sit down, not because anyone's trying to not provide you excellent service, but, but, they're, but they're trying to provide you very clean service. Um, so after condiments, menus. So we don't want to have menus passed from customer to customer. So I will not be surprised if Again, many restaurants return to a paper menu that's disposed of um, in between service. Or if you, you are asked to use your phone, perhaps use a digital um, type menu option. Obviously, if, if people want to continue to use, um, you know, multi-use menus are not allowed here. So the traditional plastic coated menu you might see some places are not going to be allowed. You're not allowed to have menus um, moving from one client to another, uh, customer to another. And of course, whiteboards. We've all seen special boards, chalkboards, menu boards of those kinds of things. All of those things um, would be appropriate as well. Utensils. I think we're going to see a lot more single use utensils too. Um, again, higher end restaurants that do use um, 
traditional silverware that have the high temperature dishwashers will be just fine. But you can also see that, that the state has outlined that those uh, utensils should be rolled. And obviously those are gonna be rolled in a napkin to prevent um, contamination from one person to another um, and prevent contamination to the silverware itself. Um, so don't be surprised if you see some places that are using single use and don't be surprised um, that, that again utensils are probably not going to be on the table when you sit down that they're you're, they're going to be brought out to you separately tables and chairs must be cleaned and sanitized between each seating um, again this is this is things that have always occurred um, it's going to actually this is one of those few things that's going to be more challenging for the you know the fast food section is they're going to if, if they're going to try to have any seating that um, maintaining that most restaurants already do this some sort of uh, cleaning and sanitizing in between patrons being sat um, certainly uh, the contact sanitizers that restaurants are as you already use are are appropriate for that and that takes us through yep we're through the hygiene anything regarding hygiene that we need to go back and touch on julia any questions we do have a couple um one goes okay. just first back to your first section about the extra sure. opening um, yep. if, if restaurants have to put up a tent or something in their parking lot mm -hmm. and use some of yep. their exterior space for seating, yes. are people going to be allowed to park on street? Is there going to be some, some type of um, arrangement mm -hmm. made so that people can actually mm -hmm. drive to these restaurants and park somewhere if they mm -hmm. are, are in fact using their, their um, parking lots? Yeah, so unfortunately in Pembroke, we don't have that option. The vast majority of our restaurants um, that are going to use some of their parking options for seating are on state routes. And so, no, you cannot park on a state route for any reason. Um, another thing that a restaurant's going to have to consider is that is it even safe to park on, on street where they're located? And that's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. But to, your, to the direct answer to your question is no, there's no necessarily right that you're going to be able to park on side streets. Now, for Pembroke, this is not as much of an issue. Most of these businesses have arrangements with abutting businesses or things like that to try to utilize some more of that parking. Um, but no one should assume that parking in a street is appropriate. And again, I... I'm just thinking the restaurants I know in my mind that are going to be using parking facilities um, within their own parking facilities of no, that will actually cut down their number of parking spots available to them and, and parking along state routes would never be advisable nor safe. Okay. So if they have a, they already have an arrangement with a, with a business that's near them Hopefully. that might not be open, have, they yeah. can continue to do that. Yeah. That's perfect. The other question yeah. that came through is can people bring their own condiments and or, um, silverware because a lot of people like bring their own straws now anyway because mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. they're not a disposable item and they're they're trying to be mm -hmm. conscious of the environment so is that sure. going to be allowed uh, that's going to be a restaurant by restaurant situation i personally am a carrier of my own personal straw um I, I don't like plastic straws and I, I carry a stainless steel straw of my own. I've never had a restaurant ask me not to use it. Um, I do know people that carry their own um, silverware for the same reason. Um, I've never seen them ask not to use it. But if you're unsure, um, especially if you're going to a higher end restaurant, I would simply call and ask beforehand, is it okay for me to bring my own straw? Is it okay for me to bring my own silverware kit? Um, and make sure that it is. The in People ask, like, well, why would anyone not be okay with that? There's actually a reason. Um, again, if if someone's personal hygiene level was not high enough, um, they have the potential to bring uh, contaminants into a restaurant location, and so that would be the concern on the on the part of the restaurant owner. So I would recommend anyone that, that wants to bring their own reusable items uh, to simply make sure that the the establishment they're going to is comfortable with that. Again, if they've switched to all disposable to control germs, and they express to you a concern, please don't bring your own items because we we cannot be sure that they will not contaminate the environment. Um, we need to respect that. That is the right of the uh, establishment. Okay, great. So those were all the ones I had so far. So now we can go on to your next section, which is staffing ah, and operations. Take staffing it away. Staffing and operations. Now we're going to move a little bit quicker through this section because this is a longer section. Um, again, there's not a lot of things in this section that the average restaurant owner is not going to be somewhat familiar with. The first one we talked about already, um, as far as patrons, res reservations being encouraged. We can't have groups of people congregating in long lines to sit down. No shock there. Restaurants may not use buzzers or anything else to alert customers. This is obvious. You can't have a device being handed from people to people to people. So those are prohibited. Um, 
provide training to workers, this is really obvious. They, they should be going through the protocols with workers about the new levels of hygiene, the new products they might be seeing or using. Um, restaurants should uh, adjust workplace hours and shift. We already covered this. We don't want overlapping of staff. We want the same you know, core group of staff working together. We don't want a lot of overlap of shifts. That's more possibilities for the disease to spread. Um, limited visitor, visitors and vendors, this is really obvious. Um, it used to be very normal for, for sales reps, liquor reps to, to come in, maybe hang out at a restaurant for a while. All of those things want to be minimized. In other words, if it isn't someone working for the restaurant and or patronizing the restaurant, they really shouldn't be there. And workers should not uh, be working if they're feeling ill. This has always been the, the case at every restaurant. This has always been the case at any food establishment. Um, that, uh, going along with the next one, of if, if you are ill, do not go to the establishment. And do not be surprised if you are exhibiting signs of illness if you're denied entry. Um, I, I would like to think everyone's smart enough as a patron not to put one of their favorite establishments at liability. Um, now's not the time to go out if you're not feeling well. Now's not the time that if, you know, you have any kind of symptoms, um, you really need to do your part for everyone as well as the businesses and stay home. Um, encourage workers to test positive to stay home. Well, obviously, this and this is a, a pretty obvious one. Um, and if a worker is sick, there's a disinfecting protocol. This has always been in place with restaurants in case anyone has ever been sick on staff. This is not new to them. Um, Notify workers that they, that they may not come to work if they have COVID. Again, this one's really obvious, um, but it's just spelled out to be safe. Um, testing of any other staff is recommended. Obviously, if you have someone that's positive on staff, you should close down clean, and you should consider testing the rest of your staff and, 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 and tracking that to make sure that you don't have a possible outbreak. We saw this at the two Walmarts. We saw this at a couple of the supermarkets. Um, so this is, this is a really kind of an obvious thing, and I don't expect it to be a problem, but it is spelled out just to be safe. Um, post notice to workers and consumers on health information and safety measures. Again, all those measures, all that documentation, all those posters are on the state website. All you have to do is hit print. By all means, if you wanna make a nicer looking document, you're welcome to, but you're not required to. You don't have to get fancy. You can just post right, every link is right there at the state and print off all of them. You do need to designate a person in charge. This is nothing new. Again, to the restaurants, there is supposed to always be a person in charge on each and every shift to make sure that the guidelines are followed. Because remember, these sanitation guidelines are not new. They're just heightened because of COVID. But we've always had communicable diseases to be concerned about within food service establishments. Restaurants will be allowed to maximize their outdoor seating space, including patios and parking lots where available and where municipal approval is obtained. Now, this is where it's gonna get interesting. Every town is gonna to handle this a little bit differently. And at the end, Julie, I'm gonna go into exactly what Pembroke is doing. Um, but keep in mind, when you suddenly have outdoor seating, there's planning approval, there's zoning approval, there's building approval if you're using a tent, there's electrical approval if you're putting lighting in, there's fire and gas approval if you're gonna have outdoor patio heaters. So restaurants should be aware that that while it's being encouraged that you build up an outside infrastructure to, to allow your business to be successful, there are some checklist things that need to be done. And at the end, we're gonna go through exactly what Pembroke's doing to make that work for everybody. Um, when taking reservations, um, restaurants should retain a phone number of the party. It, it, this is why res reservations are so um, encouraged. God forbid if something does happen and someone does become sick, by having someone on record with the reservations the restaurant would be able to contact you after the fact and say, unfortunately, someone that might have been serving you has become ill so that you can be aware and you can be um, notified if there's a problem. So that's why something like that is a really positive thing. That is new with COVID specific. Encourage the use of technological solutions. I mean, Julie, I think you and I get like a gold medal of using technology in the face of COVID, right? right. Um, but using the technology for, for um, making reservations, P perhaps restaurants are gonna have more online reservation capability, more online menus. They might encourage you when you sit down, please open our app or please open our website to look at our menus. And again, we all touch our phones and if we're touching our phones and Instead of a menu or something else, we're limiting um, possible contact tracing, which is great. 
Um, workers who are at high risk, um, obviously restaurants are going to have to consider their high risk category and possibly not having those people report and work if possible. And workers are, are strongly encouraged to self-identify if they have any symptoms. In other words, it, it goes back to the whole, if you're sick, don't come to work. If you're experiencing symptoms, share that with your employer and take the appropriate steps. So that takes us through staffing and operations. I don't know where we stand with uh, questions now. Okay, um, I got to check. I do have one that I I, I thought of that I, someone mentioned to me before. Sure. Is the whole question about um, paying by cash? And evidently, mm -hmm. um, some restaurants deal with cash. I mean, tips. I'm sorry, tip tipping by cash. Mm -hmm. Tips are different yep. if they're handled by cash yep. versus credit card, and yep. it's better for the employees and the staff there if they're tipped in cash. But do we yep. want people handling cash? So can you answer that whole yeah, question? Yeah. So that one's always been. Um, a really tough area because yes, it is it, it is better economically for your server when they receive cash. Um, the the problem comes that when you hand someone cash now, the potential for that cash to be contaminated, and the problem for that server becomes now they're handling all this cash. Um, hopefully, they have a, a pouch, an apron, or someplace they can put it and then wash their hands. So after they're collecting, you know, each table, uh, presumably they're getting their cash tip at the end of their service. They're they're cleaning their table. They can they can put that cash tip in a jar and wash their hands before they go out to ha you know help someone else. But this is one of those occasions where we have to rethink that. Is cash really the best thing? safety wise and i would not be surprised if you see some restaurants saying no cash whatsoever um, because of that so it is important to check with the establishment you're going you know to about you know like we talked the the personal use straw the personal use utensils um, bringing your own condiments and then it what their payment policy is in regards to COVID. i think that's something that we we should all consider checking out before we go someplace Okay, perfect. So check with a particular restaurant. Okay, um, yeah. cleaning and disinfecting is your next section. So take it away. Oh yes, so much fun. So again, you know, it was it was a culture shock to a lot of us to start talking about cleaning and disinfecting when it comes to COVID, and certainly a little bit more of a challenge for some of our stores that weren't um, as robust in this, we'll call it. But for the grocery stores and the food service establishments, this wasn't really that terrible. Um, clean commonly touched surfaces this is nothing new to them um you, i'm sure everyone's even seen a checklist up on a bathroom door to to keep checking and, and everything else now it's a requirement though keep cleaning logs that include the date the time and the scope of cleaning so i think we're going to see more and more of those logs posted within kitchens posted on bathrooms and, uh, and employees initials of when they went last went through and cleaned um so i think we're going to see a lot more of that um, conduct frequent disinfecting of heavy transit areas. So if there's doors or stairways where there might be railings or anything else someone needs to do to access a building, I think you could see a lot more contact spraying, Lysol type um, items, hand uh, wiping uh, with a, a disinfectant towel. You're going to see that a lot more in a lot of your, your restaurant facilities. Implement procedures to increase cleaning and disinfecting in the back of the house. This is in the kitchens. Again, we don't have a lot of problems here in Pembroke. Uh, the vast majority of our food service establishments operate at a really high level already. But again, I think they're probably even going to heighten or maybe make more frequent their particular cleaning strategies. Um, and then the, in the event of a presumptive um, COVID case, the restaurant must immediately close for 24 hours. So this is really important. Um, that's the COVID specific one, that if they have a test positive case, they do need to close down. They will likely bring in a professional cleaning service to go through the facility. Um, this is where you might get contacted um, by a facility if you've been there and someone has tested positive. Um, so th that's that's where we're, we're gonna see a little bit different. Everything else is pretty routine stuff for them um, and already in place, but this is where it's gonna get you know raised to the next level, so to speak. Okay, so before we go on to the next section, um, I've, mm -hmm. I've got a couple questions. What, sure. All the things that you've outlined so far, it seems to me that it's a, it's a lot of work and a lot of probably expense for mm -hmm. each of the restaurants yeah. involved. Mm -hmm. Is there any state, federal, or local help to support the cost of these COVID-19 yeah. um, things that have to be done? These, these things that are happening. So, so the simple yeah. answer is yes and no. Okay. I've heard that there's different chambers that are trying to, to help um, some of those things. I do know that the representative Cutler has talked about many times the different um, loan programs that are available to small businesses. For example, if a business has to go out and get a tent to, to 
implement outside seating, I would certainly think that is COVID related and that would be applicable um, for those loans or grant assistance. Within Pembroke itself, no. Um, the only thing I can offer from Pembroke directly is this fast track program, which we're about to dive into. And I can tell you that the fast track program has no fees associated with it, so long as you're a licensee in good standing. Um, and as far as the costs, I, I will say this. The, the cleaning and disinfecting items that are on hand at a restaurant really haven't changed. Your standard restaurant cleaning and, disinfect, and disinfecting that should always have been done also takes care of COVID. Um, we, there's a lot more communicable diseases. I, I constantly joke that, you know, just because COVID's here, nothing else went away. They're all still there. So these restaurants do have and have always had a lot of these cleaning products on hand. The worst thing I think is going to be for them is the fact that the, the outdoor seating is going to be definitely an expense, um, developing that, whatever they spent on that, and that they might need a, an additional staff or bus member or two to help, you know, maintain that, that higher level of cleaning or more frequent cleaning. The items actually being used are familiar to them um, and should, it should be on hand at every facility. So I would say seek the state grant money. I would say um, talk to your local chamber if there's any assistance there. Um, again, all the cleaning supplies and everything else should be the same. There should be no radical uh, cost changes there. Okay, so, and one other probably thing that they should mm -hmm. be doing, I would just think, even though I'm not a restaurant mm -hmm. owner, is anything they spend on this tax-wise, um, I would think would probably end up being some type of a write-off. So I would, they, I would sh certainly they should probably... So. I, I would think they should talk to their accountants, accountants and, right. and figure... Yeah, and, and and say, but I, I don't know any business owner that is not tracking these things right sure. now. They're, they're keeping detailed records of all these things right now to begin with. Um, so I, I would think that, that, that that's something that they should talk about their accountant or their attorney with. But yes, I would think any of this infrastructure, any of these special requirements should all be well documented for, for their taxes for 2020. Okay, perfect. So now you're on to the outdoor alteration of premises. Yes. Take it away. So this is... This is where it all gets very exciting. Um, like I said, other than the COVID specific stuff in the areas we already covered, a lot of that cleaning and sanitation is very familiar uh, to restaurants. Where we get unfamiliar is um, this point where we say, hey, now take your whole restaurant outside. <laughs> so for a lot of places, they did not have outside seating or had minimal outside seating. And now they're going to be looking at only outside seating at the outset. So there's several problems with this. First of all, for anyone with an alcohol license that didn't already have an outdoor seating permit, there it, it's technically illegal to suddenly take your whole permit outside, except we, we again, thank you to the state rep, we're just notified that it has passed the House and is headed to the Senate, um, the special bill that will take care of that. That bill still requires local approval authority, which means Everyone with an alcohol pouring permit that wants to take it outside still has to put an application before the Board of Selectmen. So what Pembroke did is this nice document that you've put up for us, Julie, is outdoor alteration of premises and additional outdoor seating. What we did in Pembroke is we said, okay, we know we have anywhere from 25 to 50 businesses that are going to want to take advantage of this. And they're all going to want to do it right away. They're all going to want to be open right away. How can we meet their needs? So what we did is we made this four-page document that literally are, allows a business owner. And I'm going to pick on Pat Gibbons for a second. Hi, Pat, if you're watching. So I suddenly own the Alumni Cafe, and I want to set up outdoor seating. And, of course, I am in Pembroke. I'm a Pembroke institution, and I want to go outside with my seating. This second half of this document, now that we've taken care of the state requirements, walks you through everything you need to set up your outdoor seating with alcohol pouring, provided that the, the Senate, you know, ratifies the, the legislation that, that left the House, so that you can do that. You can move your operation outside in one step. Because what has happened internally in the structure of Pembroke is you've seen the Board of Health, you've seen um, public safety, fire, building, uh, planning board, select um, board, all get together. And we've actually been talking about this for a month, what this is going to look like so that we could be prepared for this moment. And we all sat down and we said, we need to fast track this program. We need to give everyone a fair shot to get open. We know these businesses are struggling. They've been closed for eight weeks or more, depending on their, their ability to do takeout and everything else. And they need to be open. So we created a fast track program, which literally walks through how to take your seating outdoors, 
it satisfies the requirements for the alcohol board in that describe your temporary alterations and they can literally write down what are they doing outside very simply and that you have the legal right to occupy the proposed area and then it rolls right into square footage seating capacity and one thing i want to point out that's very important is occupancy um, down there in that third box under that waived phase two um, bold that occupancy is super important because this is where every community and every business owner should be careful when you get your alcohol permit, it has a very specific occupancy. Usually it's a fire rating, builder building rating capacity for your, for your building. So let's say, again, I'm not sure what the exact occupancy is on the alumni, but let's say it's 100 and you're moving your seating outside. You are still tied to your total occupancy number. This is something that um, the assistant town manager did a lot of research on and God bless her for, for getting all that done because your change of alteration of permit does not increase that number, or you have to go to a full hearing and everything else. The fast track just allows you to do the seating outside. It doesn't allow you to change your overall occupancy. So I would urge everyone, obviously this is it's some, something that people in areas other than Pembroke are gonna have to discuss with their own community. I, won't, I don't wanna be clear that I'm not speaking for any other community, but in Pembroke, your maximum number inside, outside, upside down, is going to be what your occupancy is today. Whatever your occupancy permit from the building and fire department is today for whatever establishment, that is gonna remain the same. And you can have all those seats outside, but when we start adding back in indoor seating, your total occupancy indoors and outdoors together cannot exceed your total occupancy prior to COVID, whatever your, your occupancy um, amount is. And then you just go right through this document. It's, it's nice and simple. What's your number of entrances and exits? What's your tent or cover dimensions if you're going to have any? Are you going to try to use partitions? If so, what are those partitions? And then we move down into public safety after that. So this is a pretty simple, this is what I'm doing. I'm going outside. I'm doing X, Y, Z. And, and you can go ahead and do so. So Julie, just as we've covered that, that what this outside template looks like and how to get it, do you have any thoughts or, or did any questions come in from the outside world? Um, let me check. So the building and wiring inspections, all that, is, is that just, they need to read through this specifically and, and just kind of get mm -hmm. familiar with what exactly they're gonna be having to do? Sure, but I mean, it's also business specific. I mean, I could certainly see some people are going to do tents with lighting. Right. Others will not. Others might just do table umbrellas. And they would write just that, table umbrellas. Um, I'm going to do a full tent with lighting. You're going to write, I'm going to do a tent with lighting. And that's going to check off um, internally for Pembroke that we know the wiring inspector needs to take a look at that. Um, I'm going to do a tent with lighting and um, portable heaters. Again, you can do those things, but again, the, that's going to check off a couple things for Pembroke to let us know that the fire department needs to head out there as well. Okay. And the gas, gas inspector. Gotcha. So once everybody gets this information and it'll be mm -hmm. hopefully on your website later on today, they go through it. Yes. And hopefully uh, the restaurants have been thinking about all this anyway. Can yes. you talk about this express lane permitting event that you're going to be having? Yes. So on top of all of this, so now we've we've gone through this and we still have a little bit more to cover, but uh, we know people are still going to have questions. And it, it we wanted to be as sympathetic to the time and the needs and the, the, the express needs of the, the restaurant community. So in Pembroke Town Hall on Monday from 10 to 3, and Tuesday from 10 to 3. If you want to print off and fill out these documents, or if you don't have a printer, I, I'd like to think you do, but if you don't, um, you can come in and get a blank set of these documents and fill them out. And you can then hand them into our team, which is going to be sitting and rating, that there's going to be a team of four or five of us, that, that this is our only function between 10 and 3 on Monday and 10 and 3 on Tuesday to process these applications. And the reason we're doing that is if something's missing or something's unclear, or something isn't approvable for whatever reason, we're gonna address it right then and there. And we're gonna give you the opportunity to, to correct your application or maybe reach out to a vendor. Uh, I'll give an example. You decided to get a tent and it was a great tent from AB Tent Rentals. Um, but on here for fire safety, you're supposed to have the fire rating of the tent. And maybe the tent, the person renting you the tent didn't happen to send over um, the fire rating sheet that goes with the tent. You will be able to sit there on the phone, call them up, say, hey, can you fax over or, or send over or, or can I get from you the um, fire rating for, for the tent? I need to turn that into the town for the fire department. 
we're going to be able to correct all those things um, as they happen in real time because the purpose of Monday and Tuesday is we are then going to put forward for the selectmen on Wednesday night a full slate of every business that is looking to amend their usage to include outdoor seating or use their uh, amend their usage to have outdoor pouring. We're going to put it all together in a bundle, complete, double-checked by all the appropriate departments before the selectmen for a vote Wednesday night so that if the governor decides to go June 10th, June 25th, whatever date, the, I'm sorry, June 18th, the, the governor's going with, that these businesses will be appropriately licensed and prepared to go. That was the, the whole purpose of all this is we don't want to be, we Pembroke don't want to be the, the holdup to anyone getting open and we don't want um, people uh, having questions, not getting those answered. Okay, great. So, Here's, here's another question for you. Yep. If, if everything's going to be um, outside for the mm -hmm. foreseeable future, is this, can you just speak to how long we think that phase two will go? I think that one's going to be really tough. I, I think if I, again, I, I don't read the governor's mind, but if I could read the governor's mind with what medical information he is getting, I have to think that we're going to see this for most of the summer. I think we'll start to see smaller numbers inside. I think we'll start to see smaller numbers inside maybe beginning mid-July. I think those numbers could be as low as 25%, which is, you know, a very low number. Um, and that's to ensure that there's adequate spacing between the tables. Um, but before we're back to a full inside dining scenario, I, I think it will be, you know, as late as August, September before we're going to see a full inside dining scenario. And I think that's why the governor took such the extraordinary steps to allow all of this. Right. Okay. Um, and we kind of want that before it gets starts getting really cold out because that's not, not we fun. We would like that before it gets <laughs> right? cold out. <laughs> and, and the other question I, I have is um, inclement weather. Um, let's say it's there's lightning. I mean, are, are there certain weather events that would require restaurants to not have their outside uh, service available? Sure, of course. And and we, as the emergency management team, I know you're familiar, but just for the folks at home, if they're not, or certainly any of the business managers, as they're not aware, um, the town of Pembroke actually has a pretty fantastic little email and text alert system that you can sign up for. We do watch the weather and before in advance of any kind of significant weather event, we always put out little advisories and that comes to us through organizations like NOAA, that comes through us um, from MEMA, that, that comes from a lot of different locations, that if we're going to have a significant weather event, we're going to put out an advisory on that. So that would be a really great place to watch. Um, obviously, a business owner might also elect they might look at the weather and say, oh, it's going to be cold or weird and I'm not going to, you know, open today. And people should pay attention that in bad weather scenarios that a lot of places may not be open uh, for safety, for convenience, for how about it's just really hard to enjoy a nice dinner if it's going to be thundering and lightning outside the tent. Right. So people are going to have to be hopefully cognizant and, and, and patient that this, this is not optimal for really bad weather dining. But certainly a light drizzle or just the sun, you know, having a nice tent or an umbrella would make that um, much more pleasurable. Um, if we feel the weather is significant and enough, the emergency management team always gets together and we will issue an advisory or, or, an, or, or an order. That doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, that if, if there's really going to be a weather event that's just so drastic and so dangerous, yes, we might issue an order um, that that would be closed. But if we're going to have a weather event that drastically, I'd like to think people are going to be aware of it and, and choose not to be um, eating out at that time. Okay, the other thing is about kids. I mean, so many families would love to bring all their kids back to, uh, to, to a yeah. restaurant. Uh, booster seats, things like that. Are, yeah. are, are restaurants going to be required to have all those things available for, they are. for children? Yeah, they are. But again, sanitization is a challenge. So not dissimilar to sanitizing a seat in between each family service. All those booster seats are going to need to be sanitized in between each and every service. And um, parents are going to have an extra burden when it comes to this. The idea that your child can wander around a restaurant is not going to be appropriate in a, in a COVID situation. Um, so parents, you know, I, I encourage that. I want to be clear. Families should go out and enjoy themselves, but children should never be unattended in the best of circumstances. And certainly in COVID circumstances, a child wandering around, wandering in and out of tables is, is exposing that child and other patrons um, to risk. So I would not be surprised if an establishment manager, um, should a child be observed wandering about, 
that the parents would be approached and ask their child child to, to sit back down with the table. It is expected that you stay seated at your table unless you're using the bathroom or if you have to go back to your vehicle for something. And if you do get up in those circumstances, you are expected to put on a facial covering again. Um, so I think it's safe to take kids out to eat. I think unfortunately in in the COVID world that, that there's gonna be a higher burden on parents um, and, and some tougher parenting that's gonna be necessary to make that successful. Okay, another question. Um, so if Monday and Tuesday, a bunch of restaurants come up and they, they give you their, their, their mm -hmm. forms, they filled them all out. Are they self-certifying that they've done all this um, or do you have mm -hmm. to inspect them before they can open? What's the process there? All of the above. So uh, all of these things are gonna happen simultaneously okay. and again, in a perfect world, no, we would we would issue a permit and we'd go out and inspect each and every one um, before they open. Obviously, everyone's going to have the same opening date, uh, and unless it's uh, the 18th, I can I can just about assure you there's no way we will. If it's something like the 10th, which will literally be the day after we do this, or even the day the selectmen are voting, there's no way we're going to get to every facility. However, the town does have a strategy. Um, it's a team strategy between the building department, the fire department, myself, and our two independent restaurant inspectors, and the object would be for my myself, the building department and the fire department, and probably with the, the assistance of public safety being the police department, to visit each location and at least put eyes on it. Now, obviously, a, a police officer is not a health agent, and a health agent is not a fire inspector. However, we, we've all been over this document and the, and the requirements and the needs of each department several times. So we do have an idea that at least if there's a problem area to alert the other staff that, hey, I saw something at this location that's a little concerning. Um, and in this situation, I, I think that within 24 hours that someone from the team will have looked at each of the establishments. If it's a faster timeline, if it's Monday, I think we will have looked at all of them. And then the food inspectors are actually all slated to go out in June to the very earliest at the beginning of July, which means every place that is open will actually have a food inspector with a regular full food inspection within the first month. We feel that this strategy, along with responding to any number of complaints that come in, specific concerns, that we will have been able to give, you know, kind of an overview check of everything, an in-depth inspection of everything, and, and everyone will be on the same page. We feel safe enough and, and, and certainly the, the safety compliance that's here, remembering that restaurants, as far as all the sanitation and everything else, have already been doing this. Right. So we, we have a pretty high level of confidence in that, that this will be pretty darn successful right out of the gate. Okay, so uh, to recap, um, mm -hmm. you have this four-page document that really gives all the information anyone could possibly need. Um, it will be on mm -hmm. your website later today. Um, yes. Download it, fill it out, ask questions. Can they, are there, if people Absolutely. have specific questions, can they call and, and ask their specific Absolutely. questions? Okay. Absolutely. Okay, and then Monday and Tuesday um, from 10 to 3 is when people come in person to, to uh, yep. drop these off to facilitate uh, the process from there. As mm -hmm. far as the date they can actually open, you're saying that the selectmen's meeting on uh, Wednesday? The selectmen's meeting on the 10th will vote the the change of premises. Okay. I don't know what date the governor's going to give for the phase two opening. Obviously, no one can, can do anything before the governor's declared opening. Okay. Um, we know that the governor has promised us all he's going to say this on Saturday. Right. So I'm sure everyone's going to be glued to their television on Saturday um, and find out what that looks like. But the the actual pouring would definitely be held up until Wednesday night till the selectmen's meeting at 7 p.m. Okay. So the idea is by next Thursday, everyone who has turned in their documentation, uh, whether they've turned in it independently or they've come to our express lane walk-in so that they can address any questions right as they're you know, um, submissions being looked at, mm -hmm. that by Wednesday night, the vote of the Board of Selectmen at approximately, I'm going to guess, 730, that they would be fully appropriate with the Pembroke regulations and with the state regulations and good to go first thing on Thursday. So Great. That would be great. And fingers we will, crossed. Uh, yeah, keep, fingers crossed. So we will keep, um, PAC TV here, we'll keep any, any time Wonderful. available. If you need to do updates to this, um, we can let people sure. know exactly what's going on. Otherwise, um, we will definitely have you back probably in a week or so to see how it how it went 
how it's going. Yeah, and uh, youth sports. Remember, we have youth sports to talk about. That's the next big topic, uh, right. right behind restaurants. We can talk about youth sports and the challenges they're facing getting open. And daycares and summer camps also. So maybe we could also have kind yeah. of a, an, an, another update on that for our residents. We can have residents. a kid lesson. We can have kid day. We'll okay. have kid day on, <laughs> on PAC TV, and we'll cover all the kids' stuff. Wonderful. Okay, this has been great. Um, as you can see, Thank we you. date stamp everything we do here because everything changes day to day. So for now, a lot of great information. Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, everybody uh, who's working on this in, in the town of Pembroke. Go to the, uh, the website uh, for updates all the time. Click on COVID-19, the big red banner. You can't miss it. And um, if you want to see this again, pactv.org slash Pembroke. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Stay safe. Keep going. Great job, Pembroke. Proud of you. This is Julie Thompson for PAC TV signing off. Thank you.